Okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you are having a wonderful day so far. Welcome to the freemathhelp.ca grade 11 live stream brought to you by Scholarly Elite Tutoring. We are a company out of Simcoe County, but we also provide tutoring in, G in the GTA, Ottawa, and in Peel region, and we provide online tutoring to students all over North America. So without further ado, we're going to get started. And I hope that if you guys have any questions, even if they don't have anything to do with the materials that we're learning in the lesson, please feel free to leave them in the chat. That's what we're here for, is to help you out with whatever you're working on in class. And whenever we don't get questions, we go right ahead and teach a lesson on the most valuable skills that you do need to know for this grade and for future grades. So the way that we've chosen these lessons is for, I mean, the way that we've chosen the lessons for each grade is based on what is the most important and most um, typically tutored topic for that grade level, as in basically saying what is the area that most kids struggle with, and we try to attack those in a way that makes sense for everybody. But we also make sure to pick topics that carry on through the rest of math. So these are topics that you are going to need for future years in order to be successful, not just in this grade, but also next year as well. So without further ado, we can get started. Today we are going to finalize basically our unit on trigonometry. Last week we covered trigonometric identities, which is a very, very um, difficult topic for many people. I would say probably most students that I've tutored find that to be one of the most difficult topics in grade 11 math. And it's very important that we have a basic understanding of what it is that trigonometric identities are and how they can be applied because next year you're going to be using those identities again and in a more complex manner. And on top of that, you're not going to be using degrees anymore. You're going to be using um, another form of angle representation called radians. So if you take a look at the unit circle on the screen here, you can actually see what I'm talking about. You'll see, for example, 30 degrees, which is right, oh, didn't mean to move the whole thing. If you look at 30 degrees right here, it's actually something called pi by 6 radians, and that's a fraction. Uh, 90 degrees is pi by 2, 180 degrees is pi. So in the way that the unit circle in degrees goes from 0 to 360, the unit circle in radians goes from 0 to 2 pi. And uh, it's very important that you understand the core aspects of the unit circle and how it works prior to changing over to radians because once you change to radians it, it makes it much harder to understand if you don't have a good basic understanding of what is going on. So as you can see here when we talk about the various angles like for example we'll use 30 degrees again we're talking about 30 degrees as in this 30 degrees from here to here which I'm trying to draw without going over the lines so just bear with me for a second. And um, if I'm not being loud enough, please let me know. I will speak louder. I just don't want to deafen you guys by yelling into the mic because um, I do have a fancy new streaming headset. I look like a 12-year-old uh, boy with my headset on as if I'm ready to play video games, but hopefully it um, will actually be more helpful for you guys to hear me properly. So anyways, point of the story. What's happening here is I actually... If I'm picturing this as a, you know what, forget about all that, let me just use a straight line, makes life so much easier. Okay, so pretend we have this straight line from here to here, okay? And this is now a 90 degree triangle. Obviously, I'm just going to draw that 90 degree square in real quick. Okay, so for example, if I'm talking exclusively about 30 degrees right here this is 30 degrees and when I talk about that 30 degrees I've got a triangle that has 30 degrees 90 degrees and obviously 60 degrees because we know that every triangle has 180 degrees in it altogether so on the unit circle what's really being asked is um, the sine and cosine of the various triangles within within each part of the unit circle. And 
That's why, and if you've tuned into previous weeks, we talk about these special triangles. Well, I'm going to show you today how these special triangles relate to what's going on in the unit circle. So if you can take a look, I've got on the unit circle this 30, 60, 90 triangle right here in the first quadrant. And on the right side here, I've got this 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And what I know based on just general knowledge about trigonometry is that there is a standard um, kind of formula, I could say. It's not really a formula, but just basically there's a standard understanding, say that five times fast, of what these angles are going to be. So if I have 30 and this is 60 and this is 90 and I know that, that's my triangle, I've actually got a very good understanding of what the sine and the cosine of all of this is going to be because I know the side lengths as a result of the fact that this is on the unit circle and I know the side lengths based on that. So the hypotenuse in this case is always going to be 2, just like here. It's 2a, but that's because we use these as ratios in the long term. Um, and then from this side, it's going to be, oh, I lied. Hold on. Yeah, sorry, this side is root 3. My bad. Sorry, guys. And over here, it's 1. This is true every dang time, you guys, okay? This is always the same thing. As you can see here, as you can see on the unit circle, this is always the same thing. This is why I tell people, you know, some teachers will say, oh, memorize all the sines and cosines of quadrant 1. In actuality, it's harder to do that. It's easier to just memorize these two triangles, the 30, 60, 90, and the isosceles, which has a 45, 45, 90 angle ratio. And you memorize their side lengths and where the side lengths go. And then as a result, you actually will know all of the sines and cosines for the throughout the unit circle. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I look at these points here, so this point right here, well, that point is indicated as a cosine and a sine. So the way that it works is you have cosine first as the x value and sine second as the y value. And the easy way to remember that is that they're alphabetical. Um, so cosine is first and then sine is second. So let's see what that means. Well, we know that based on Sokotoa, Sokotoa, I'm just going to draw it over here. So Sokotoa, good. We can figure this out. So if I'm looking at Sokotoa and I know that my side length here is root 3, and I know that this side length is 1, and I know that the hypotenuse has a length of 2, and I want to solve for the cosine of 30 degrees, then I'm going to look at the adjacent, which is 3, and the hypotenuse, which is 2, and simple enough, you get root 3 over 2. All right? Now, if I wanted the um, sine of 30 degrees, then I'm going to get the, I'm going to use another pen color. I'm going to do this. I'm going to look at the opposite length and the hypotenuse, and then I'm going to get 1 over 2. So instead of memorizing all of these, all I really need to memorize are these two triangles. And it's much, much easier, guys, I promise you. Because, as I said, these are ratios, and that's why we've indicated these like as 2a or a, because the a's also mean 1. So if anyone is confused by that, or if there's a part of that that you want me to explain further, just let me know, um, and I can definitely do that. So the reason I bring all of this up is because today we're actually going to take trig identities one step further, and we're going to do something where we solve for the actual answers to trig identities. And in order to do that, we have to have a very, very solid understanding of the concepts I just referred to. So like I said, these two triangles, they're called the special triangles. Give them a goog. Go to Google and uh, just, you know, or you can screenshot this if you want, or if you want, email us here and I will send you uh, a PDF version of these. Um, 
because they're really, really going to help you out. All right, so keeping all that in mind, let us move on to the real point of what I'm talking about today, which are the solutions to trigonometric equations. And before we do that, I'm just going to do maybe one or two quick refresher examples on how to solve trig equations for those who might still be struggling. Um, if anyone is doing this in class, and even if you're not doing this in class, it's very important that you keep ahead and you practice these because like I said, these are going to be a big part of your grade 12 year as well. And if you're doing other stuff in class that you would like us to address, just let me know and we can do that. Alrighty guys, so I'm using X because I had someone email me after last week and say, please just stick to X. I personally like theta because it is more correct, but either way, it's just an unknown variable. So we'll do X for now. And if I forget, just feel free to yell at me in the chat. Okay, so let's take a look here. And before I actually do that, let me just pull some of these identities into the situation here. So we've got... reciprocals. There they at. There they go. This guy and this guy. So for grade 11, these are kind of the three main tings you need to know. Quotient identity and our Pythagorean identities and your reciprocal identities. Okay, so these are just um, standard equations, aka identities, that like I've said before, some nerds sat around and figured all this stuff out just to make our lives complicated. But that's okay because we're here now and we are going to work together to figure stuff out. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we can break down. One of the strategies I was teaching you guys last week is that whenever you're given a trig identity, try your best to get it down to just sines and cosines because that's when you can start canceling stuff out. So in this case, I know that secant of theta or in this case secant of x, which means the exact same thing, is also represented by 1 over cosine theta. So what's really happening in this part, whoa, what was that? I didn't know it could do that. That's pretty cool. Learn something new every day, you guys. So this part right here, secant, of x, uh, secant x over sine x, can also be represented like this. Secant x divided by sine x because a fraction is just a division. And I highly recommend that when you are doing these, you break these down into the simplest terms like this, just like I did here. It will actually help you visualize this much better because when you start stacking fractions on fractions, it just gets really complicated for no reason. So I'm gonna now change secant of theta or x into one over cos, just like this. So this is now, instead of secant, I've got one over cos and that's divided by sine of x. And just like anything, when it's just chilling like it's by itself like this, like a villain, we know that it's technically over the number one. So, you know, for example, like if you saw the number four by itself, we know that technically it's over the number one because four divided by one is still four, but we don't write it as a fraction every time because that would be annoying. Although in cases like this, when you actually are doing a fractional division, it will come in handy to write things as fractions. So we're gonna go ahead and do this and do the flip here just like any fraction division becomes a multiplication and then this flips these two things swap and we get 1 over sine x and then still everything else in the equation is chillin not changing cool and now what we're going to do is literally numerators times numerators multiply the denominators and you get 1 over cos of x and sine of x and I highly recommend writing these down you guys um, the more examples that you have available to you the easier it is to refer to and look at so that you can kind of use strategies of your own because there are millions of possibilities for this okay million might be an exaggeration but for, I would say at least hundreds of possible trig identities, if not more. And really it comes down to understanding the conceptual framework for breaking it down as opposed to memorizing stuff. So 
here I've got 1 over cos of x. And just like anything else, like I was saying before, whenever you see stuff chilling like that, it's over the number 1. And I can put the 1 as a denominator, a common denominator, because I know that 1 is over 1 and cos of x, or negative cos of x, is over 1 as well. So they have a common denominator. And we're still keeping this tan of x here chilling. Alrighty, guys. So now we're just going to go ahead and multiply these two fractions. So nooms times nooms, denoms times denoms, and we get 1 minus cos of x over cos of x sine of x equals tan. Okay, this is a part where literally most kids that I've tutored will ask me, okay, well, can't you just cancel the coses out at this point? And the answer is no. And every time you do that, a f an angel loses its wings. JK, a puppy dies. But either way, it's a bad thing to do. Don't do it. You cannot just cancel x's out because this whole, th I mean, cos is out because this whole thing is one term. So we have to treat it as such. I'm going to do my haphazard erasing here. So keeping that in mind, um, at this point, that's really annoying because, oh, hold on. I've been writing this whole thing wrong. This is cos squared. That's going to change what's going to happen right now, actually. So 1 minus cos squared of x can also be written as something else by looking over here at the Pythagorean identities. And we know that if I was to rearrange this uh, identity, I get 1 minus cos squared x equals sine squared x. So I'm just going to sub in sine squared x into this part of the equation. And now I can cancel stuff out. And I'm going to show you why with a little movie magic over here. So remember, like I was saying, if you change these into y's and x's, it makes this a little bit easier to understand as a concept. So instead of saying sine squared x, I'm going to say y squared because I'm going to call sine of x y. I'm going to call cos of x x. And then this becomes y squared over x y. So just like in grade 9 when we did exponent laws, we now know that you know because there's no addition or subtraction with this sine squared, we can actually just go ahead and do the division here. And this becomes y over x because y squared minus uh, y squared divided by y to the power of 1 is just going to leave us with y. Okay? If anyone... <laughs> Sorry, I had a visceral reaction to puppies dying. <laughs> Sorry, pink hair. I, I'm so pink chair. I apologize. Um, that visceral reaction. Keep that in mind so that you don't, um, so that you don't use that. So you don't do that mistake. Okay, guys. So that's why I use really bold, crazy imagery because it actually has been proven to help you remember things when you have like very emotionally charged words attached to them. It's actually a study technique. So um, sorry for saying puppies dying, but I was just using it as a way to make you remember that uh, you can't cancel stuff out in situations like this where you have 1 minus cos squared x. Okay, sorry guys. Um, so keeping, with, keeping that in mind, sorry, I didn't mean to freak anybody out. I apologize about that. Um, but keeping all of this in mind, so at this point, sine squared x and, uh, sorry, sine squared x over cos x times sine x is going to become sine x over cos x, which if we look here at our quotient identities, we have got tan, which is what we're trying to make this equal to. So tan of x equals tan of x. Okay, I'm going to leave that up on the screen for like 10 seconds or so, or you know, 15 seconds, just so everyone can write stuff down. And if you do have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat.
Okay. So hopefully I that gave everyone a good chance to write that down. So, and also if you didn't, just so you guys know, in case uh, you only come here for the lives and you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, these live streams are posted to the YouTube channel. We don't have the first few weeks that we were doing this on there, just because originally I was silly and I just would stream for like six hours straight without breaking it up, but now I do like two hours for the grade nines and tens and then two hours for you guys in the grade twelves. So they're a little bit easier for YouTube to deal with instead of one big like six hour video. Um, but you can go in and watch previous weeks if you did miss last week and you didn't see the lesson on how we do identities. Um, it actually will be a really good help to you, at least in my opinion, not <laughs> maybe not your opinion. I don't know, but worth checking out if uh, if you are confused by anything we're talking about today. So moving on. What we are going to look at now is something that has very mu uh, that is based on the stuff that we've been learning since last week, which is solving trigonometric equations. So what this really means is that instead of proving why two sides of an equation are equal to each other, we're actually going to use algebra with our knowledge of the trigonometric identities in order to solve for the answer, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about because it's it's one of those things that you kind of have to see in order to fully um, appreciate. Okay, so our reciprocal identities, we've got our quotient identities, and hopefully you guys can see these. I've started breaking these up into three separate things just to make things a little bit larger on your screen, so hopefully that is uh, visible for you. If it's not, just let me know. Because again, it's hard for me to gauge what, uh, how large things look on your screen. Um, alrighty guys, so basically what's going to happen is we're going to get a question like, mm, let's do this one first. So cos of x plus root 3 equals negative cos x. And up until now, we've been given these types of questions so that we can solve for how these two things are equal. In these situations, they're asking you to solve for all, sorry, solve each trigonometric function for all possible values in degrees. And I'm going to limit this for values between 0 and 360 degrees. Your teacher might not. You might be given answers. Uh, you might have to give answers for like 0 to zero to 720 degrees or whatever. Um, and I'll show you how the questions are gonna be phrased. So we have questions like this. You'll see the words associated with them say stuff like solve uh, each trigonometric function for all possible values in degrees. Use, oh no, no hints. Um, from 0 to 360. Because again, as you know, when we have coterminal angles, then sometimes you can have angles that have the same identities, like all the way up to the thousands. Um, we're not going to get into that today because I'm not trying, to, not trying to confuse anybody with my uh, stuff here. So, alrighty guys. Let's take a look at this. So <laughs> when you get a question like this, like I said, we're no longer trying to prove that these two things are equal. What we're trying to do is solve it. And when we look at something like this, we can say to ourselves, alrighty, well, this is very similar to like a linear equation in the sense that there's nothing squared. Uh, there's unknown values that uh, we can group together by moving stuff around. And so we are going to do that. So first things first, again, when you're solving stuff like this, what you're really trying to do is get the unknown identity on one side and then all the numbers on the other side. And this is a very standard type of question that you're going to get on a test or that you would get on a test. Um, so I'm going to show you how we can solve this. So just like if this was to say, oh, if this was to say x plus root 3 minus x, 
right? Let's say we got this question in grade nine and your teacher said, give this to me in y equals mx plus b form. What would you do? You would move everything over to one side. And when you do that, this side is going to be left as zero because there's nothing else there. So I'm going to go ahead and move this x over to this side of the equation. And it's going to become x plus x plus root 3 equals 0 because I got rid of that x. That's a 0, guys. I'm trying to write better, but sometimes it looks like a Ghostbuster sign. I apologize. OK, so back to our real letters and numbers that we're using. So we're using cos of x plus cos of x plus root 3 equals 0. Cool. So you guys, what's going to happen now is I'm going to move the positive root 3 over to the other side of the equation because like I said, we want unknown identity on this side and numbers on the other side. And I'm going to group together these two identities, cos and cos. It's going to become two cos, as you can imagine. And on this side, it's going to be negative root 3. Okay. This is where this identity stuff starts to get a little bit wonky. So now just like, uh, sorry, in the next step it will. Just like you would in algebra, you're going to divide 2 off of cos of x because, again, you don't want anything else impeding the situation. So those 2 divided by 2, the 2, but, ah, sorry, guys. 2 divided by 2 is going to cancel. We are going to be left with cos x equals negative root 3 over dose. So... This is the first, this whole thing that we did here. This is part uno of answering this question. Already, What we have to do now is solve for which angles, which thetas, which x this is actually true for. And automatically, when I see an answer with a root 3 in it, I know that I can just come right over to my 30, 60, 90 triangle and start here. But what's really important to remember is that in our unit circle, cos is only negative in this and this area. Okay, why is that the case? Because we know that cos and sine act in the same way that x and y do. So if this is a normal Cartesian plane, only this part has a negative x value. Okay? That's what's happening here. So what I need to do is first solve on a basic level, what's my angle that I care about? So in this case, where is root 3 over 2 um, the accurate response for cos? So I know that so based on Sokachoa, we have Sokachoa and cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I'm going to look here, where is root 3 my adjacent? That's right here. So this has to be some kind of multiple of 30 degrees. It cannot be 30 degrees because 30 degrees is in quadrant 1, wherein cos is positive. But nonetheless, it will be some angle that has to do with 30 degrees. So how do I solve for that? Well. First, I'm going to have you guys do me a favor. If you have your calculators with you, I want you to type in root 3 divided by 2. Make sure you're in degrees, not in radians. So the root of 3 divided by 2 is 0.86. Okay. So then you're going to plug in cos of 30, and you're going to get that same number, 0.86, which can be rounded, I guess, technically to 0.87. doesn't really matter. The point is that that's what we're trying to look at. Now, if we look at the triangle, uh, sorry, the unit circle here, I'm just going to erase something quickly so that I can show you what I'm talking about. Remember that 30 degrees is 30 degrees off of the x-axis. So let's look at in the other quadrants where we have something with a similar exact relationship. Well, that would be the 30 degrees off of this part of the x-axis. How can I determine that number? Well, if, if a straight line, like from here to here, is 180 degrees, then 
30 degrees off of the x-axis is 180 degrees minus 30, which is 150. So x, one of the values of x, is 150 degrees. Okay, I hope that that makes sense. Again, if there's something you guys want me to clarify, please feel free to drop a comment in the chat. I'm happy to clarify anything. Um, I just don't want to over clarify things without people address like without people specifically asking me to because I don't want to uh, you know go too deep into it and then drive you guys crazy with stuff that isn't necessarily going to make the most sense for how you solve this. So next, we also need to find out this this angle. So again, it's going to be in this part 180 degrees plus 30. That's how I get the angle in this quadrant where cos is also negative. So in that case, it's going to be 210. So what I'm going to have you guys do now is if you have your calculators with you, punch into your calculator cos of 150 and you'll see that it is negative 0 0.866. And then I'll have you do the same thing with cos of 210. And again, it is negative 0 0.866. So this part is part two. So how did we do that again? Just to reiterate, what we're doing is we are, in part one, solving algebraically to isolate cos of x by itself. And then technically, if you remember from grade 10, what we're doing at this point is basically saying, OK, well, what's cos to the negative 1 of x? so that we can solve for this part and then solve for x. So when you get questions like this, they will tell you the range in which they want you to solve them. Be very aware of that. If they don't give you a range, that means you have m a multitude of answers. So I could do like, um, you know, 150 plus 360 and do the cos of that, so cos of 510, and it's the exact same answer because, again, they're coterminal angles. They, they are landing in the same place. But because in this case, the quote-unquote teacher has told us that it goes from 0 degrees to 360 degrees, then we only give angles within the unit circle's original circle. And the way that we do that is we use the x-axis as our plus and minus point based off of the reference angles that we used from quadrant one. And sometimes the answers will be in quadrant one. It's just not that way in this particular case. So that is that. I'm going to leave that up for like 10 seconds, let you guys write down anything that you might have missed, and then we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, and if you do have follow-up questions, just as I said, so I don't sound like a broken record, just drop them in the chat, okay? Because these get to be real cray-cray real fast and I want to make sure that we cover as many possible examples as we can in a way that is um, conducive to you guys learning, but also um, efficient and also not running through them too quickly. Okay. Also, pink chair, I think it's so funny that you responded, damn. <laughs> if, I, if you're somebody that I know, have your parent text me so that I know who you are, because I think that's so funny, if you feel comfortable. Um, I think that's really funny. So, alrighty, guys. Um, we are going to erase this stuff. I'm going to just erase this because it makes not having to put all these uh, things back up on the grid. What I wish is that we could just copy-paste like this whole grid. And actually, in the tutoring software that we use for our online tutoring, which is not this software, this is something different, um, it actually does allow us to do that, which is way easier. But for the streaming purposes, we use this so that other companies cannot see what we use, our uh, top of the line, like literally top of the line, the best online tutoring software that there is on the market. No big deal, you guys. MDD. So, all right, moving on. 
anytime, anytime picture. Um, so we're going to do another example. And this one is a little bit different. And again, like I said, these are very standard in the sense that, you know, the part one, part two part of the process is the same. You are always trying to isolate for that single identity. Um, you're trying to put all the numbers on the other side, but the methodology that you use is going to change. Sometimes they're linear and sometimes they're quadratic. And so this is where understanding factoring comes into play. And like I've said in the past weeks, um, having a really good grasp of factoring makes your life a lot better in many ways. So four sine squared theta minus three. I'm sorry, I use theta, you guys. Again, it's hard to know which one you guys, like if, if you guys have a preference and you want me to use theta, you want me to use x. Um, oh damn, I just wrote theta again. Oh my gosh, guys. Last week I had not had enough caffeine. Clearly this week I've had too much caffeine. Like what is wrong with me? Okay, so this is one that has, as you can see right here, it has a it is quadratic in nature because it has a squared function in there. So keeping that in mind, we are going to have to approach this slightly differently, but the overall concept is the same in the sense that we are just moving stuff over, getting all the numbers away and uh, solving in that way. Alrighty guys, so let's take a look here. We've got everything equal to zero, which is kind of what we want. This is ideal for us because it, it saves us having to move stuff to the left and then back to the right and then blah, blah, blah. This way we're already at that port part where it's equal to zero, makes life pretty easy and we can just go right ahead. So we've got four sine squared of x and I'm going to move this three or negative three, pardon, over to the other side, it's gonna become positive. So we have root, uh, sorry, we have positive three and then I'm going to divide off the four. And yes, you can do that. And again, don't ever doubt yourself. Believe in yourself, you guys, first of all. That's my number one, my number one tip of the day. Just straight up believe in yourselves, you know, no big deal. This is the same thing as saying four y squared. Well, to isolate y, you have to divide off four. Simple as that, okay? These look a lot more complicated than they actually are. But once you, once you know that and once you have the tricks to solve them, you will, you will enjoy life a lot more in math class. So four divided by four is one. So all that we're left with on this side is sine squared of theta, x, sorry. You know what guys, I might just stick to using theta because I say theta anyways and I don't wanna confuse anyone. Um, and again, I like to do things the way that is the most mathematically correct because by the time you get to university, they're pretty picky about stuff like this. And I know that if you're in the uh, MCR3U course right now, the likelihood is that you are aiming towards university in the long run. And if you're not, that's fine too. Um, but I do want to be able to help you guys succeed in the long term and not just for this. Like, I like to think of freemathhelp.ca or even our approach to tutoring. It should not be like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. It should be fixing the wound so that you can keep on succeeding and living the rest of life. Okay, enough of my crazy metaphors. So anytime we have something squared, obviously to get the squared out or the, the root, um, sorry, the, the exponent, you know, to get rid of it, we have to square root it. So we're gonna go right ahead and square root both sides of this equation, so sine squared x, and what's happening here is a square root of both the numerator and the denominator. Okay, this is where um, it gets a little bit crazy. So obviously this side is just gonna become sine of x because that's gotten rid of the squared. But on this side, we have something happening that's a little bit different. So we have, technically, whenever we have a square root of a fraction, it's the same thing as saying this, root of three over root of four. Both of those things mean the same thing. And we know that the square root of four is two, so I actually can just go right ahead and do that. And, and I think I've said it before in the grade 11 class, I've definitely mentioned in the grade 12 class before, decimals are actually not considered to be mathematically proper. Um, fractions are much more preferred. If you look at mathematicians at the highest level, 
they will most often use fractions and they will typically leave radicals or what you know square roots in this format because it's actually much more correct than writing a decimal because sometimes decimals decimals are not just as long as it shows on your calculator they might be like 70 uh, 70 numbers long and it's not like you're going to write all 70 numbers which is why we like keeping things as roots okay hope that little segue made sense for you guys but at this point we have our first part of the question done this is what we're looking for sine of x equals root 3 over 2 and again automatically I know that I care to look at this triangle here the 30 60 90 triangle because that's where I have root 3 as one of my side lengths and because I'm looking for sine I want to make sure that my uh, numerator which is going to be the opposite so sine of x is opposite over hypotenuse well that means that I'm actually going to look at 60 degrees here okay so the opposite is root 3 and the hypotenuse is 2 so in this case x equals fractions wherein that is correct well if we take a look at our unit circle and we remember that cos and sine act like x and y in a Cartesian plane respectively right then if I'm looking for sine and it's positive then I know that I have to be in either this quadrant or this quadrant because here and here y is positive it could not exist in these quadrants because y aka sine is negative oh that's not an x <laughs> that's an x but I just meant to put it like an x not a algebraic x okay I hope that makes sense for you guys um, I wish that someone had explained this to me in high school I actually learned this as a tutor <laughs> like years after I was out of school and while I was tutoring thinking to myself why did no one ever explain this to us in high school and perhaps your teachers have and kudos to them if they have but no one ever explained it to me I had a terrible math teacher from grade 11 to calculus and like I've said before if you're listening sir you're you're terrible at you were terrible at your job but that's beyond the point so back to what we're doing guys don't let my ADD my actual ADHD get in the way of us learning so let's go back to what we were we were talking about so again just like before when we were talking about what is the possible values of X within the range of 0 to 360 degrees right now I know that the possible values of X for this particular thing this where the answer of sine of that function or sine of that angle is going to be root 3 over 2 has to be in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2 and I know based on my special triangles that that's going to be at 60 degrees so somewhere like up here and then again because 60 degrees is based off of 60 degrees off of the x-axis the same thing is true on this side it has to be 60 degrees off of the x-axis so from here we go 0 plus 60 here we go 180 minus 60 and that gets us 120 so the two answers that are true for this particular identity are the possible values of X are 60 degrees and 120 degrees okay guys so hopefully that uh, clears things up a bit for you so in this case we extracted the square roots in the previous question we collected like terms next we're going to do something where we factor the greatest common factor makes things a little bit crazier um, and actually to, s to uh, those who are curious as to how this works in radians if you want to stick around for the grade 12 class you're more than welcome to we're literally doing this exact same lesson basically but in radians um, if you don't want to confuse yourself then that's okay you don't have to stick around for grade 12 all right <laughs> oh, thanks thanks pink chair um, so what we're going to take a look at next is something very similar I think I am going to uh, erase this because it's starting to get a little bit a little bit much let's leave that there all 
Alrighty guys. Keep on trucking here. Like I said, um, with trigonometric functions, they look a lot harder than they actually are once you start to understand how to do them. That doesn't mean that they're all easy. It just means that having the core skills in place really does make a difference. I'm just going to put that special triangle there for posterity's sake. Leave that to the side for a second. And we shall continue. Alrighty guys, so here we go. Should we change our pen color? Let's do black. I feel like, I feel like it looks very, very slick. Okay guys, so let's say we have something like this. 2 cos of theta sine of theta equals cos of theta. So when I'm given something like this, my first assumption isn't that I can start doing crazy stuff to it, but that actually is what's going to happen here, and I'm going to show you what I mean. Basically, the first thing I want to do, just like always, is make one side equal zero. So let's go ahead and do that. So 2 cos of theta, sine of theta, and then subtract this over to this side, and this is now going to equal zero. Wonderful. Well, once we've done that, there are a couple things that will make your life uh, or, or your approach to this much faster. And the first thing I always want you guys to ask yourselves is, can this be factored? Because oftentimes factoring saves us a lot of time. So let's go ahead and do that. And in this case, we can factor out cos. And I'll show you what I mean. We're literally going to divide cos out of all the things, even 0. Because it's important to remember that 0 still exists as a number that we care about. Cool. So keeping that in mind, on this side, it's still just going to be 0, because 0 divided by anything is still 0. On this side, we're going to be left with this, cos of theta times 2 sine theta minus 1. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting. Because one side is equal to 0, I can actually just start dividing stuff off, and it gets rid of it completely. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by cos. Alrighty, I'm going to show it in the next step. Cos of theta, 2 sine theta minus 1 equals 0. Okay, divide both sides. Awesome. Now, this is going to become the number 1, and we're left with just 2 sine theta minus 1. Here, 0 divided by cos, again, is just 0. And this has now simplified this question. This only works when one of the sides is equal to 0, and you have stuff factored where you can cancel it out like this. Okay, Be very aware of that, and be very careful about how you use it. So... From this point, we can now go ahead and complete the algebraic portion of this question, which is just moving stuff over and dividing. Wonderful. So all that's left for us to do now is solve for which angles within the range of 0 to 360 degrees are equal to a half. Very nice. Okay. Pretend that my handwriting skills are much better than they actually are, and we will all be very happy with that. So, moving on here, we now know that this is the quote unquote identity that we're trying to solve. We're trying to solve for theta, which is just an angle. And now I actually have two possible scenarios in which this could be true based on the triangles that I have because we know that this a is technically 1, this is 2, this is 1. Actually, there probably will be more than 2. But one thing to be aware of is that root 2 obviously is not the same as 2. So in this case, we only care about this triangle yet again. I know that we seem to be favoring this. It's just that this is 
typically uh, you're most likely going to get questions like this where 30, 60, 90 is what you're looking for. So again, we know that our identity for sine is opposite over hypotenuse and that means that we need to look at the particular angle that has 1 as its opposite, which is 30, and then obviously the hypotenuse is 2. So in this case, sine is positive, so again, if we take a look at the unit circle and try to understand that in terms of x and y, and I know I sound like a broken record, you guys, but it really does help to remember this. So sine is positive in this case, which means that it has to be in either this or this quadrant, and therefore um, it's going to be either 30 degrees, because again, that's where this identity proves to be true, or it's going to be 180 minus 30 degrees. And remember, you're always using the x-axis in these scenarios. Okay, so in this case, we have sine, uh, oh, sorry, theta is equal to, and sometimes you'll see teachers write things like this, especially when you have more than uh, three possible answers. In this case, we just have two answers, but that's okay. So the answer is 30 degrees and 150 degrees. Okay, wonderful. So I'll just give you guys a second to write that down. And let me know if I am moving too quickly for anyone. I'm happy to speak a little bit slower. I've been told that I speak too quickly and I'm trying to work on it, you guys. So bear with me. We are all works in progress. And one thing I do wanna mention just while we have uh, a good number of people in the chat, something that we've been telling all of our online tutoring students and just uh, even in the other classes is that we are big supporters of kidshelpphone.ca, AKA just Kids Help Phone in general. If you are struggling with the situation that's going on right now, if you need someone to talk to, kidshelpphone.ca is a great resource. They have counselors there who are able to talk to you. And you can talk to them by phone, you can talk to them by text, they even have a messaging option. It's a really incredible way to speak to someone who cares and who can help you work through some of the more difficult things that are going on right now. So that's just something that we've been mentioning every hour and also to all of our tutoring students and I thought that I would mention it to you guys as well because I know how crazy this situation is right now and uh, that having some support is really really a positive thing. So just something to keep in mind. Okay. So now we are going to do another example that uh, takes us to a whole new level. So like I said before, if you are not, um, if you don't feel as though you are proficient at factoring or that you factor proficiently is what I'm trying to say, I highly recommend going back, downloading some factoring sheets, go to like CUDA software, K-U-T-A, just Google CUDA software, factoring, practice those sheets, um, it's really, really important that you guys master factoring because you, f you need to factor in every aspect of math. Like it's just at, at every level you need to know how to factor. And the more you practice it now, the better because next year you are going to go back to school, hopefully, given that this pandemic all blows over. And it's going to be um, much more difficult to be catching up as you go along. So not to freak anyone out, that's not intended as a, you know, as a scary thing, it just means it's something to make sure that you're practicing. All right, you guys. So we've looked at a couple different methods. Like I said, the first one was about collecting like terms. It was a linear equation. The second one was about extracting the square roots. The third one was all about factoring and finding the greatest common factor. This next one is about factoring the equation as a quadratic. And this is where, like I said, it gets a little bit interesting. So let's use blue. I like switching it up. It's gonna move all this up a little bit. Okay guys, let's take a look here. So if we've got 
this equation. 2 sine squared theta minus 3 sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. And this is pretty optimal in the sense that it's already equal to 0. If, say for example, 1 was on the left side and it was negative 1, we should always move it over so that everything equals to 0. It makes things um, properly aligned, basically. So, just like we were practicing last week and, and earlier today with the um, different method that I use, if you get this type of question and you feel like you are just confused by all the letters, change this into a typical factoring equation. This is the same, this is basically the same thing as saying this in terms of factoring it. So I'm going to use the y version to get us to factor this a little bit easier. And we're going to go ahead and use air conditioning method. If you have not been here for the past couple weeks, actually, no, I lied. We never learned air conditioning method with you guys, but I'll show you what I mean by it. Uh, I learned, I taught it to the grade 10s because it's not really a grade 11 thing, but um, definitely worth checking out. So, okay, I call this air conditioning method because if this is ax squared plus bx plus c in terms of our standard quadratic equation, then if I multiply a times c, then it's ac, aka air conditioning. Cheesy, I know, but it's an easy way to remember this. So, 2 times positive 1 is going to be 2. And we want two numbers that multiply to positive 2 and add to negative 3. And I'll just put those numbers over here. And, you know, that's pretty standard. It'll be negative 2 and negative 1. All right. So, moving on. What we're going to do now is break this down. So we've got 2y squared. And we're going to pair things up so that they make sense. So 2y minus 1y plus 1 equals 0. And then we're going to create those factors. And if anyone is confused here, just feel free to let me know in the chat. I'm happy to go over what I'm talking about. I just figured that a lot of people uh, kind of have done factoring by grouping before. So, But if you haven't, that's fine. We can, we can talk about it a little bit more. So minus 1. And this is negative, oh, sorry, positive 1 and y. Hold that thought. That's not positive 1. Guys, 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 what is wrong with me today? There we go. This is negative 1. Because remember that these two factors have to be the same thing. And our final answer for the two factors is 2y minus 1 and y minus 1 equals 0. So keeping this in mind, how can we take that information and use it to our advantage for the sine situation? It's actually not as difficult as one might think. So I'm going to now show you this whole thing in terms of sine. It's very, very easy. So I'm going to keep following along here. So if I've got two, oh, I want this in blue. Yee. All right. Two sine squared theta minus three sine theta plus one equals zero again. Same old method, 2, find those two numbers, negative 2, negative 1, and then this is going to become 2 sine squared theta minus 2 sine theta minus 1 sine theta plus 1 equals 0. So you guys see how these two things align? They're the exact same thing. That's really why I use this other method, because it helps me visualize what it is I'm trying to do. And then I take it and apply it to what really matters and what I'm trying to understand. So this is now 2 sine theta times sine theta minus 1 minus 1 times sine theta minus 1 equals 0. Final answer, 2 sine theta minus 1 times sine theta minus 1. Okay, so again, guys, this is this. This is this. This is this. That's it. And now we've actually factored these. And we have our factored answer. 
which is what we were looking for. So unlike the ones that were linear equations, when you have a factored answer, just like when we're solving for roots, you have to solve for the zeros. And that's what we are going to do. We're going to split these up. Oh, excuse green. We're going to split these up and look at them individually. So we're going to look at 2 sine theta minus 1 by itself. And we're going to look at sine of theta minus 1 by itself. And we're going to make them each equal to 0 because that's how factors work. Okay? And then, just like before, we are going to isolate for sine of theta. And we can do that very simply by just algebraically moving stuff over. So we have sine of theta equals half because I moved this 1 over and divided off 2. And here, sine of theta is going to equal 1. So this now means that we have a bunch of possibilities for what is correct. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's start with sine of theta equals a half. Looking at our right angle triangle, the special triangle over here, I need to look for things where the numerator is 1. So obviously, it's going to be sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, and 1 over 2, which makes this 30 degrees. So again, referring to our unit circle, it seems redundant, but please, if you're writing a test or if you're doing an assignment, every single time refer to your unit circles because sometimes you need that visual to kind of jog your memory. And I'm not saying that's true for everybody, but for a lot of people that is true, and it just is a lot better that way. So if I know that sine is positive, that means that sine, which is akin to y, would be in this or in this. And we need to find 30 degrees here and also 180 minus 30 degrees, which is 150. Okay, so for this part of the identity, theta is equal to either 30 or 150 degrees. And for this part of the identity, where sine of theta equals 1, well, let's pull up our unit circle here. So sine of theta equals 1, well, we know that that occurs at 90 degrees. So our last part of this answer, right here, because again, cos sine, 90 degrees, right there. And that is that. We can get rid of that. Here, theta equal to 90. So in this question, I would write this like this, 30 degrees, 90 degrees, and 50 degrees. Sorry, 150. Okay. So that is our final answer for this question. So let's kind of go back and make sure we understand what this is saying, because this was quite unique in the sense that it is about factoring. And actually, you guys, I completely lost track of time. It is time for the grade 12 class. So we are done, but I thank you for joining us. And if you uh, have any follow-up questions, feel free to let me know. You can send us an email, admin at scholarlyelite.com, um, and we're happy to address that. Even next week, we can talk about it a little bit more if people are confused. So hope you guys have a wonderful week. See you again next week on Thursday, and have a good one, okay? Talk to you soon. So, and if you are in the grade 12 class, welcome. Thank you for your patience, because I was uh, running a little bit late with the grade 11s, which was completely my fault. I just completely lost track of time. But that's okay. We will make up for lost time. So, actually, for those of you... Oh my gosh. This is what I'm trying to get at. It's this page right here. Um, which at this point, I'm just going to create a new one. Technology is not on my side today, you guys. So actually, the grade 12 lesson is very similar to what we talked about in grade 11, except for you guys, we are going to be learning about this in radians instead of in degrees because... That's just what the situation is for grade 12. 
he got to know your radiance. All right. So I'm going to quickly show you guys uh, what we are talking about today. And one thing I do want to mention is that you'll see that my special triangles are written in degrees, but that is ridiculous. We only speak in radians in this in this grade, so we're going to go ahead and fix that. So this should be pi by 6, this should be pi by 3, and this should be pi by 2. And here, same thing, this is pi by 2, and this is pi by 4, and pi by 4. So it looks a little serial killery, but that's okay. We can figure it out. All right, you guys, let's talk about what we're going to discuss today. First things first, I want us to have a quick refresher on the unit circle. This is basically probably going to be our last week of talking about just trigonometry. We've done about two, three weeks, so we've covered essentially every topic in the trigonometric functions unit, not functions unit, sorry, in the trigonometry unit. We will hopefully cover trigonometric functions because that's its own unit, obviously. Um, but if you have questions that don't have anything to do with this particular unit, you're more than welcome to ask away in the chat or you can email them to us at admin at scholarlyelite.com and we can do that. So first things first that I want to discuss. What we're looking at here, anytime we talk about the unit circle, we have cos and sine. And these things here, like 1 over 2 and root 3 over 2, are technically the values of cos and sine, but they're also points on the unit circle right here. And cos and sine act in the same way as x and y. And the way to remember uh, which is first is that cos and sine are in alphabetical order. So cos goes first and sine is second. And what's really happening with our special triangles is that we act as though when we talk about 30 degrees in particular, for example, um, we break up, and by 30 degrees, sorry guys, I'm still in grade 11 mode, pi by 6, which is equal to 30 degrees. So pi by 6, when we're talking about pi by 6, we're asking ourselves um, what are the values of the side lengths in this particular case. So here we have this side length, which is the hypotenuse, as 2, this side length, which is root 3, and this is 1. And that's really what's happening. The unit circle does not need to be memorized. You really just need to memorize this fact, the cos and sine fact, and you really need to memorize your two triangles. Everything else is not really necessary to memorize if you have a good understanding of what the unit circle is. Okay, so keeping that in mind, today we're going to be expanding on the trigonometric identities that we did two weeks ago. Um, I know that last week we did something a little bit different, but still within the realm of trigonometry. We are going to be solving trigonometric equations today and seeing what all of that fun is about. Now, if again, you have questions that don't pertain to this lesson, that is fine. Just let me know in the chat and I will address those there. Okay, wonderful. So, oh, Sorry, just grabbing the piece of paper that I need here. Alrighty, guys. Let us begin. Now, again, like I said, highly recommend writing down the special triangles. Highly recommend searing them into the back of your brain. I mean that metaphorically. You really, 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 truly, from the bottom of my heart, I'm saying this, you need to know them off by heart. It just makes things so much better for you. All right. Oh, goodness. Sorry, that was like the grade 9 work. Okay, guys, so today we're going to be solving trigonometric equations. And what that really means is that we are going to expand upon the skills that we used two weeks ago to solve trigonometric identities to actually figure out what angles things are accurate for. So before we get that started, I am going to do like one example of a trigonometric identity just to get everyone's minds flowing and make this a little bit better for you. So let's go ahead and do that. And I know I say so a lot. I apologize, you guys. I've been talking for like five hours straight. So give me a bit of a break, but not so much of a break. You know, keep me accountable on some level. Here we go. 
let's take a look at this. If we've got cosecant squared of theta times secant squared of theta minus uno equals one over cos squared theta. So before we get started on this identity, we want to pull up some of our more important identities that are the Pythagorean identities. So this one right here. Let's take a look. Wonderful. So cosecant squared of theta, if we were to take a look at this identity over here, can be rewritten, but we're not going to do that for this particular instance. What we are going to do is just go right ahead and actually complete the multiplication that's happening. But before that, what I want us to do is break this down into its reciprocal identity, which is 1 over sine squared theta. And then multiply that by 1 over cos squared theta, because secant squared theta is equal to 1 over cos squared theta minus 1. So let's go ahead and do that multiplication, foil that in. So we get 1 over sine squared theta times cos squared theta, because it's numerators times numerators, denominators times denominators, then 1 over sine squared theta. Then we're going to make a common denominator, which is one of the most common ways to solve these, is that you just got to make a common denominator. It's simple as that. So we get 1 over sine squared theta times cos squared theta, and we do this on the numerator and the denominator, multiply it by cos squared theta so that we can have that in both. Again, because this whole thing is equal to this. And we don't, and we need, don't to need to write it every time, time. just have it in have mind, in mind that, that we're trying to make these two things be equal to each other. All righty. All righty. Sorry, you guys. Sorry, you guys. <coughs> At this point, we're we'll left with 1 minus cos squared theta over, over sine sine squared theta cos squared squared theta, theta plus 1, plus one over cos squared theta. Again, again, I'm going to stop writing this on the slide just so that I don't confuse anybody. Now, now. So as we so remember, as we remember I, should, I, should, I should refer to the I identity, 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 identity rearranged, and one and minus, minus cos squared theta, theta is the same thing, same thing as saying sine squared theta. Square theta. So I'm going to go oh, ahead and, go ahead and do that. that. So I'm going to so replace one minus, one minus cos, cos, cos squared theta, theta, theta by sine squared theta, theta, and, and that leaves that us with sine squared theta over sine squared theta times cos squared theta. And if we and refer, if we refer to, to our little trick that we trick learned, that we learned the, week the week before, before where, we're, where saying we're saying this is the this same thing as saying y squared divided by y squared x squared, squared. Well, then well, these y squared, y squared do cancel. Do cancel. And we're left and we're with left 1 over x squared. squared. So in so this, case, this case, these cancel. These cancel. I was trying to get purple there. Purple there. Goodness. Goodness. So these guys so these cancel. Guys cancel. Oh, my oh my gosh. How did this not work? Two times in a row. There we go. There we, there we go. Cancel, cancel those, those bad, bad boys. boys. And we're left with 1 over cos squared theta. theta. Well, let's well, refer let's back to over here. here. Pretty sure Pretty that's sure what we were trying to do from the beginning. the beginning. The whole point of this was to make this equal to 1 squared, 1 over cos squared theta, which we did. And if we want to further simplify this, it actually equals uh, 1 over secant, uh, sorry, secant squared theta. But that's OK. We don't need to worry about that. The point is that we made them equal. Alrighty, you guys, so that was just kind of a quick refresher on how to do that, but what we're really here to do today is to smile, obviously, but no, we're actually going to, oh, this is so annoying. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to pull up some identities that we're going to need here, so Pythagorean, quotient, Let's see what else we got, what else we got? Reciprocal. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Trying to refrain from coughing, but I've literally been talking all day, so I might have to cough a little bit. And what I think is that I should have one of our tutors fill in for me. The problem is that actually we would do that, have one of the tutors fill in because we have over 100 tutors. But the problem is that uh, it's actually quite difficult to set up streaming software, especially for us old people. So that's why I'm doing it every week. 
Alrighty guys, but if you do want to talk to one of our tutors, we do have online tutoring. We use a top of the line online tutoring program um, that is actually super awesome. Like this program that I'm using is not the program that we use for online tutoring. Our, our, our system has like video and um, audio capabilities and also it records your sessions if you choose to. So you can actually get a recording of your session so you can go back and watch what you and your tutor did and it actually is literally better, in my opinion, than home in-home tutoring because you have an actual record of everything the tutor and you did together, and then you can just go back and watch it if you want clarity. So anyways, that's beyond the point. Let's take a look at some of these identities. So <clears throat> when we talk about questions wherein we are asked to solve trig equations, you are going to get a question that says something along the lines of, solve each trigonometric, trigonometric, just making sure I spelled it right, function for all possible values in radians. So we actually, in the last class, we were doing this in degrees, but for us, we're going to actually do some that are a little bit more complex and also cover radians, which is what you guys need to know for grade 12. Now, typically you will see two types of problems. And it's very important that you practice them so that you can automatically recognize whether something is a linear trigonometric equation or if it is a quadratic linear, uh, sorry, a quadratic trigonometric equation because that will give you some insight into how you should approach the question. I'm going to start with one that's very easy and then we're going to work our way up to some of the more difficult ones. If you have questions along the way, do not hesitate to ask. I'm happy to slow down or explain because that's what we're here for. Okay, guys? So, cos of theta plus root 3 equals negative cos of theta. So, automatically when I look at this, I can tell that this is a linear function because it's not squared and pretty much everything is going to operate using the linear standard, which is really just algebra. Therefore, what we do in situations like this, and really with all of these types of questions, is we want to get all the numbers onto one side and all of the uh, trigonometric gobbledygook, as I like to call it, onto the other side. How do we do that? Well, just like in algebra, if I have something on one side that I don't want there anymore, I move it to the other and it changes signs. So here, if this is cos of theta and I'm moving this one over, it's going to become positive, so it's cos of theta again. And then I'm left with this equaling to zero on the right side. This now becomes 2 cos of theta plus root 3 equals zero. And I can just move root 3 over so that, oh my gosh, I pressed this silly button on my pen here. There we go. So I'm going to move root 3 over. It's now going to become negative root 3. And I'm going to divide off 2. So if you're confused by this, um, what I highly recommend is actually after this is over, if you're confused by how I'm doing things, A, let me know. I'm happy to go over them. But if you want things um, broken down a little bit slower, I did this basically this exact same lesson for the grade 11s, but it was in degrees. So you might be more familiar with degrees and then you can um, watch that lesson. And also I do it a little bit slower there because they might not be as familiar with all of this stuff. Um, so anyways, just something to note because it will be live on our YouTube channel afterwards. Alrighty guys, so at this point I have completed the first part of this type of question which is solve and isolate. Oh, not part two, part one, which is isolate the identity. And that was not too crazy. We literally just moved everything to one side and everything else to the other side, numbers on the other side. And now I have a an identity where I have cos of theta equals negative root 3 over 2. That is very interesting because, I'll show you why, if I could, if I could get my special triangles, it would be very nice. Oh, not what I was trying to do. Oh my goodness. Sorry guys. Like I said, technology and I, we're not getting along today, but we are working on it. 
So in this case, I'm going to look at my two special triangles, and I'm going to see where do I have something that has a root 3 in it, and automatically I can see that that's my 60, uh, 30, 60, 90 triangle. And I'm just going to take a look at that one. Now, obviously in grade 12, you are required to not call this 30, 60, 90. You have to refer to it by its radians, names, which are pi, oh, pi by 6, pi by 3, and pi by 2. Okay? I highly recommend memorizing this, you guys. You, If you know this triangle and the other triangle as well, the 45, 45, 90, or pi by, two, uh, pi by 4, pi by 4, 90, uh, pi by 2, you know the whole unit circle. That's the beauty of it. The unit circle is just these triangles flipped around. And I'll show you what I mean. So first things first, when we're talking about the unit circle, we need to kind of discern which area we are referring to in this particular instance. So let's take a look here. If we recall, the unit circle operates just like a typical X and Y Cartesian plane in the sense that cos refers to X and sine refers to Y. Now, keeping that in mind, that means that wherever Y is positive, sine is positive, and wherever cos is positive, x is positive. Therefore, what I need to look for is the quadrants where cos is negative, aka where is x negative? Well, we know that here x is negative, and here x is negative, because these are like negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, blah, 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 right? So, sorry guys, just one second. Sorry guys, just give me one quick second. Okay, now, going off of that basis, we need to figure out in quadrant 1, where cos is positive, using these angles that we know, what is the answer to this particular conundrum? So cos of theta is equal to negative 3 over 2. Well, let's find out where cos of theta is equal to 3 over 2 first, and then work with that. So in this case, let's take a look here. We've got cos, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. And in this case, what is adjacent here? Well, we have pi by 6. And hypotenuse is 2. And simple enough, we can figure out that pi by 6 is the angle that we care about. So pi by 6 is the same thing as saying 30 degrees. That's right here. Okay? Now, we know that pi by 6 is not our answer because the cos of theta in this instance is negative. So what I want you guys to do right now, I'm going to, if you have your calculator in front of you, I want you to say root 3 divided by 2 and you're going to get 0 0.86. Okay? Then I want you to go cos of 30 and you're going to get the same number, 0 0.866. Then I want you to go cos of 150 and you're going to get negative 0 0.866. So we need to figure out what is 150 degrees in radians? And I'm going to show you guys how to start thinking in radians in general. Because what we really need to know is what is pi minus pi by 6 and what is pi plus pi by 6. Because that's going to give us this answer and this answer. So let's go ahead and do that. So the two answers here are going to be pi minus pi by 6 and pi plus pi by 6. And what's really important to remember is that you can make this have a common denominator. So the one answer is 5 pi by 6, and the other answer is going to be 7 pi by 6 by the same logic of having a common denominator. Okay? 
So theta in this instance is equal to 5 pi by 6 and 7 pi by 6. And remember that these are the only two answers for this question because, and actually I, I'm saying remember, but how could you remember something I never said? We're only looking for 0 to 2 pi. Typically, your teacher will tell you what range. I like to keep things within this range, but you can also say, let's say that the range was larger. You could say theta is equal to 5 pi by 6 plus 2k pi and 7 pi by 6 plus 2k pi because that's going to bring you to the same coterminal angle. Okay, hopefully that makes sense for you guys. If it doesn't, just let me know, and I'm happy to address it. Alrighty. So moving on. So in the box here is our final answer. I'm just going to leave that up for about ten, like five, ten seconds so that anyone who wants to write it down can write it down in their own nice writing instead of my serial killer writing. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to write meter, but it's really hard sometimes to keep things perfectly written. So I'll let you guys write that down. Okay, so let's go right ahead and do something more complex in this one. Hopefully, if you guys have questions, you are um, going to let me know in the chat because there is no problem to go back and explain stuff if we have to. That's what we're here for. And I don't want anyone to feel like they can't ask questions is why I repeat that sentence like 500 times every hour. Alrighty guys, oh, we're almost there. Erasing complete. I'm going to change my pen color because again today I'm just liking the black, like it just looks so slick. Um, let's take a look at one more linear function that's a little bit harder. Again, that was something more along the lines for the grade 11s. This is going to be more in the range, no pun intended, of the grade 12 course. So if we have like root 2 sine of x minus tan x, x and theta are interchangeable. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Alrighty guys. Now, remember as I've always said with identities, you really want to bring them down to sine and cos as quickly as humanly possible. So I'm going to leave 2 sine and I'm going to change this to theta. Sorry guys, just habit. And then change this to sine theta over cos theta, which you can see here is one of our quotient identities. Okay, is equal to zero. And one thing I am going to do is make a common denominator by multiplying everything by cos because I see here that I have a fraction and cos is the denominator, but it's only one of the two pieces of the puzzle. So I have to make everything have cos in its denominator in order to fix this. So to do that, I'm going to have 2 sine of theta times cos of theta over cos of theta minus the original thing that was here the whole time. OK, and then we can put this all under the umbrella of the one thing. And I say under, but really it's over. Theta cos theta minus sine theta, because it's all under the same denominator, all over the same denominator. And now we can do something fancy by getting rid of cos, because when I multiply both sides by cos, it's actually going to cancel out on this left side, and then 0 times cos is just going to be 0. So I'm going to be left with just the numerator, 
Now, I am going to show you guys what I'm talking about because I used to hate in high school when teachers would tell me stuff like this and not show it, and then I would be so lost. Which is why I like teaching math because I feel like I'm just, you know, filling all the gaps that no one taught me in high school for kids who deserve to know the truth about math and how it's not as hard as it looks because just because things look crazy doesn't mean that they have to be. Like Ronald McDonald looks crazy, but he seems like a nice guy. You know, he has a lot of charities and stuff. And uh, I'm craving chicken nuggets right now, so can't you tell? Anyways, point of the story beyond my need for chicken nuggets is that we are going to cancel these guys. This cos of theta is going to become zero, and all I'm left with is two sine of theta, cos of theta, minus sine of theta, equals zero. Yeah! Now, down to business. At this point, especially when I have something equal to zero on the other side, I automatically say to myself, can I factor some stuff out of this so that I can get rid of it? The likelihood is yes, because I have sine theta in the first part, sine theta in the second part, aka I'm a factor out sine theta. This makes life so much better. So what I'm left with here is 2 cos of theta, or root 2 cos theta, minus 1, because sine divided by sine. Sine divided, wow guys, what the heck is wrong with me? Sine divided by sine is what I'm trying to say, is 1. Anything divided by itself is one. Monkeys divided by monkeys is one. Bananas divided by bananas, one. Um, so yeah, and then now I'm going to divide off sine of theta from both sides. And lo and behold, this magical zero gets rid of stuff. And here, the sine divided by sine is just one. And this goes away. So we get root two cos of theta minus 1 equals 0. This I wish I could like divide my chores into 0 and get rid of them that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Still have to clean and cook, but a girl can dream. Alrighty, guys. Moving onwards. What we've got here is an opportunity to now solve. Now, obviously, we need to follow our algebraic steps and move things over piece by piece. And for those of you, I mean, you're all, you've now been in math for four years, assumedly, or at least four semesters worth of math. And you know that in the Ontario curriculum, showing every step is what gets you the highest number of points. So I always tell people, even in grade 12, show every silly little step. It actually increases your marks. Now, we have a radical in the denominator, and we want to rationalize that. So we are going to multiply the no denominator and the numerator by root 2. Why? Because the root of anything times itself is equal to the thing inside of the root. So root of x times root of x is equal to x. Root of, you know, m times root of m equal to m. If we were to use a number, root of 2 times the root of 2 equals 2. Because there's like an algebraic reason for it. It's realistically saying the same thing as x to a half times x to a half because at the end of the day, we know that this becomes one base, half plus half because of our um, power rule. And then this becomes x to the power of one. So that's actually the technical reason why this is happening. And again, that's the, it's not really necessary for you to write any of that stuff out. It's just stuff that I wish I had known when I was in high school. So, you know, trying to live vicariously through you guys. It's no big deal. So let's multiply both here. Again, just the number one thing you should say to yourself. If there is a radical in a denominator, it should not be there. You've got to fix it. And the way to do that is to multiply it in the numerator and the denominator. So what we're left with is cos of theta equals root 2 over 2. And I know for a fact that one of my special triangles does have that information available to me, and that is the 45, 45, 90, which in radians we refer to as the 
pi by 4, pi by 4, pi by 2 triangle. And we can take a look at where this is true. So first thing I want to note, cos is positive. So that means that I need to determine first which quadrants I'm interested in here. And if cos is positive, that means I'm looking for the quadrant where x is positive, which makes this quadrant and this quadrant. Oh, no, not that quadrant. My bad. This quadrant and this quadrant. So quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. OK. Don't worry about my serial killer looking stuff here. So I know that I really care about two angles, realistically, basically two in this case, um, one of which is in quadrant one and the other of which is in quadrant four. And what I need to do now, so in this case they're using the ratio version, but I'm just going to call this one, I'm going to call this one, and I'm just going to call this two pi. I mean root of two is what I meant to say. Root of two. Read it, but to do. There we go. And what's going to happen now is I need to ask myself, okay, well, where is this true? Well, I know that originally cos of theta being 1 over 2 would have been the adjacent over the hypotenuse of 45 degrees, aka pi by 4. So theta is definitely at least in quadrant 1, pi by 4. And then I need to say to myself, well, what is this part of the x-axis minus pi by 4? So this is 2 pi here. And then to get my answer, I would say 2 pi minus pi by 4. How do I solve that? Make a common denominator yet again. And we can go ahead and say 8 pi. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's right. 8 pi minus pi by 4 equals 7 pi by 4. So those are my two answers. It's they are 7 pi by 4 and pi by 4 because those are the areas in which the cos of theta is 1 over root 2, a.k.a. root 2 over 2. And we can see that that is correct by pulling up a unit circle real quick. Just right quick, you'll see. Oops. Here we go. All right, sir. So, oh, that's not a unit circle. Sorry, guys, my brain is starting to go. It's been a long day of math and meetings. So, there we go. Because, you know, before we do this in the day, I do my real job, and then I do this, which I actually consider fun just very long and tiring sometimes. So bear with me if I'm starting to sound a little bit crazy. So as you can see here, the cos of theta for pi by 4 is root 2 over 2. And the cos of theta for 7 pi by 4 is root 2 over 2. And those are the only two quadrants where we have positive cos. Yay! OK, guys, we are now going to move on to something quite a bit more difficult. Um, and that is still based on what we're learning right now. It's just that we need to understand how to use factoring in this same kind of method. Um, so again, I'm just going to type out the kind of question that they would ask you. So this is another formia format that they would say. So solve each of the following trick equations, giving exact answers where possible, and rounding to either the nearest tenth of a degree or hundredth of a radian when exact answers are not possible. Use the range 0 to 2 pi. OK, you guys. Let's talk about that. Oh, didn't mean to open that. OK. So we are going to look at a couple different versions of this. The first of which is 
this one. Let me just change my pen color to something a little bit more formal. It is root 3 tan of theta minus 1 and sine of theta plus 2 equals 0. And then we've got, again, your teacher would give you this range. It would look like this between 0 and 2 pi. Oops. Theta, 2 pi. OK, you guys. Well, this is actually quite interesting because it's already been factored, which is basically saying that they've already done all the difficult parts of the question because a lot of times people find it hard to factor. Um, couple things. First and foremost, when we have two factors like this, we need to break them apart. So we're going to have... Now, sorry, that's when the factors are equal to zero. If they're not equal to zero, then you need to move stuff over and refactor to make sure that everything is equal to zero. Um, but in this case, they are equal to zero, so we have root 3 tan theta minus 1 equals zero and sine theta plus 2 equals 0. And let's break them down piece by piece. So in this one, we're just going to algebraically solve for tan, which makes this 1 over root 3. And I'm going to rationalize that. So it's actually going to be times root 3 times root 3. And that's just going to end up being root of 3 over 3. And if we were to solve for this using our triangles, we can totally do that. Let me just pull up a triangle here. So just because I rationalize the answer doesn't mean that I would use the rational version to solve for what I'm looking at, if that makes sense. Like in this case, what I would do is actually look for the opposite over adjacent of the angle that gives me the answer for tan of theta where it's literally 1 over root 3. So opposite, 1, root 3, adjacent, and that means 30 degrees is the angle. In this case, aka pi by 6. So there we go. We have pi by 6 is one of our angles. And again, it's very important to note whether tan is positive or negative. In this case, it is positive, and we know that the only two quadrants where tan is positive are this quadrant and this quadrant. So pi by 6, and then we also need to look at pi plus pi by 6, which is going to be 7 pi by 6. And that is our other answer. Because again, we always use the x-axis, and then we add that. So these are our two angles. This one, from here to here, and this one. OK? Hopefully that makes sense for you guys. If it doesn't, just feel free to drop a comment there. I'm happy to explain. I'll give you guys a second to write that down real quick. And then we'll do the next part. OK, guys, let's do the second part. We've got about 15, oh, 16 minutes all left. And I think that is a good amount of time to get this last part done. So this one is a little bit easier. Oh, sorry, I'm just fixing my writing area because it was not comfortable to sit like that. Okay. 
So here I'm just going to get sine of theta equals negative 2. And this is the kicker here, you guys. The range is only from 0 to 2 pi. And nowhere in the unit circle do we have within 0 to 2 pi. We do not have any part of the unit circle where the sine is equal to 2. Therefore, this is not applicable. And you don't answer this part. I mean, by an your answer would be not applicable. OK? All right, guys, so let's do another one where we factor as quadratic type. So let's, where we actually do the factoring ourselves. So we're going to move this here and uh, try out this last problem. Oh, no. No. Why would it do this? Oi, create paper. That is super annoying. Just give me a second, you guys. Okay. Back to it. So, we are going to look at this question. Actually, we're going to do two different questions. One that's a little bit easier, one that's a little bit crazier. So first it's this one, 2 sine squared of theta minus 3 sine theta plus 1 equals 0. So first things first, we see that it's equal to 0, which is awesome because that's really what we're looking for. And, and immediately when I see a question like this, I'm going to change this into my other format to just make it easier for my brain to visualize. So using my air conditioning method, I'm going to factor this and get 2y squared minus 2y minus y plus 1 equals 0. And then I'm going to factor this down. So I'll show you guys what I'm talking about right now. Basically, and I'm trying to leave space so that I can put the signs in afterwards. So we've got 2y y minus 1 and negative y, sorry, negative 1 is what I'm trying to say, negative 1 times y minus 1, because again, these two factors have to be the same, equal to 0, the answer is 2y minus 1 and y minus 1 equals 0. So let's do this same process with the sign. So if we do that, we've got 2 sine times 1, which means 2 sine squared plus 1. Basically what this breaks down into is 2 sine squared theta minus 2 sine theta minus 1 sine theta plus 1. So you see how this is literally congruent, we could say, it's the exact same thing, equal to zero. Then I can just go ahead and factor so much easier because I've already done my factoring. It's now just using the y, the sign instead of y. So this is going to become doo -doo -doo, uh, sine of theta minus one, minus one, sine of theta minus one, Zero, and then the final answer is going to be 2 sine theta minus 1 times sine of theta minus 1. And if this is confusing you in terms of the factoring, definitely practice your factoring. It's super important that you guys have that down pat. So now we've factored this, and that means that we're just going to break it down into its separate pieces, its separate factors, make each one equal to 0. So separately, this one here, and then this one here, sine of theta minus 1 equals 0, and just solve for sine. So in this one, it's going to be sine of theta is equal to a half, and sine of theta is equal to 1. And then we have to solve for theta. And that's very easy. Again, 
first things first, we need to determine which quadrants we care about. And in this case, we know that sine is, I mean, in every particular instance where we're talking about the unit circle, sine acts like y. So y is positive in this quadrant and this quadrant. And that means I only care about angles that have sine equals a half in quadrants one and quadrant two. Okay, keeping that in mind, we will open up our triangles here. Oh, I have no triangles. I'm just gonna draw them. So the triangle that I care about in this instance is going to be the uh, 60, the 30, 60, 90 triangle, which in radians is pi by six, pi by three, and 90 degrees. And then that's what this triangle has. So obviously I see that sine, I know that sine is uh, opposite over hypotenuse, so that means that I'm looking at pi by six because that's the opposite, which is one, and the hypotenuse is that. So one of the angles here is pi by six, and the other angle, so pi by six is 30 degrees, so it's right here, pi by six. And I also wanna know this angle, the same, you know, the same amount off of the x-axis. The way that I do that is I say, well, the x-axis here is at pi, I need to go pi minus pi by six. So that's gonna be pi minus pi by six, which becomes six pi by six minus pi by six, and that's five pi by six. Okay, so those are my two angles, five pi by six and pi by six for this part. And remember, we only care about zero to two pi, so that's why we're not expanding on that. And then here we want to know where sine is equal to one. Well, we know that sine is equal to one at the 90 degree point. So that's going to be theta equals pi by two. And then you would write this correctly. The most correct version of this would be stacking them in order. So you have pi by six, uh, five, uh, sorry, pi by two and five pi by six. If your teacher wasn't restricting you to just zero to two pi, you could write theoretically plus two k pi because that would bring you back around plus two k pi plus two k pi. But because we're only talking about zero to, to two pi, we will not include those because that goes beyond the first circle. Okay, we're gonna do one more question and then we are all done for the day. But again, if you guys have questions that you want us to cover, you can email them to us at admin at scholarlyelite.com. Okay, let's uh, just do one last thing here. Okay, so this last question is quite a doozy, so I highly recommend writing it down um, just for posterity's sake and so that you can obviously have a reference. But if you ever want to go over these, these are going, to, or hopefully this is going to be um, on our YouTube channel, so you can always come back and watch these if you're not sure. So, first things first, it's all equal to zero, so that's not something we need to worry about, but we do want to make this in terms of just one identity. And if we recall, there is an identity that says, squared of theta equals one plus tan squared theta. So this is an identity, a Pythagorean identity. And we're gonna apply this identity. So instead of having it say secant squared of theta, we're having it say one plus tan squared of theta. And the three is gonna stay where it is because we didn't change the three, we're just changing the secant squared of theta. Just gonna double check, yep, good. The rest of the equation stays the same. Cool. Now, from this point, we're gonna just obviously multiply this in by foiling it. So three plus three tan squared theta minus two tan of theta minus four. It's important to note that tan squared of theta and tan of theta are not like terms. It's the same thing as saying x squared of theta plus x. 
they're not like terms because one is squared and one is not. But 3 and negative 4 definitely are like terms, so we can go ahead. Oh, hold on. This was squared the whole time. That's my bad. So these actually are like terms now that they're squared. So now that we know that, we have tan squared theta and negative 1 equals 0. So from this point, we obviously need to move stuff over. So we've got tan squared of theta equals 1 because we moved the 1 over. And then we're going to square root both sides. And whenever we square root 1, the answer is both positive and negative 1. Okay, very good. So from this point on, we need to determine where that is true. Let's just pull this up here one second. Yeah, so in our unit circle, which I'm going to see if I can find a quick unit circle. Yes, I have. Luckily, very nice. So in our unit circle, we want to look in areas where tan and uh, sorry, cos and sine are the same because we know that tan of theta is sine over cos and that's how we can determine where tan is 1. And because it is both positive and negative 1, that means that uh, it really is anywhere where we have pi by 4 or a multiple of pi by 4. So 3 pi by 4, 5 pi by 4, 7 pi by 4. These are all places where tan is going to be either positive or negative 1. So we can go ahead and say that pi by 4 is equal to, uh, sorry, <laughs> theta is what I meant to say. Theta is equal to pi by 4, 3 pi by 4, 5 pi by 4, and 7 pi by 4. Because in all of these instances, tan is equal to 1 because root two, negative root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2 is going to be 1. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. If you guys, I'm going to leave that up for like, I don't even know, 15 seconds or something, just so you guys can write that down. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. And uh, yeah, so this will be our last week for now anyways, because we still technically have two months left. But uh, for now, this is kind of a wrap to the trig unit. And that does not necessarily mean that you cannot ask trig questions if you end up doing trig in class and you have questions from your distance learning materials that your teachers have sent you. But it just means that I won't be teaching any more trig lessons specifically. I will be teaching trig function lessons, though, where we're going to learn how to graph these. So keep your eyes out for that. And in the meantime, something that I've been saying every hour is uh, that, and that we've also been telling all of our online tutoring students, that if you are having a rough time right now and you want someone to talk to, Kids Help Phone is available to you. You can go to their website, kidshelpphone.ca. They have amazing counselors who work around the clock to talk to people about the issues that they're experiencing. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be something severe. If you need someone to talk to, Kids Help Phone is there for you guys. And honestly, like I'm not affiliated with Kids Help Phone. Scholarly Elite is not affiliated with them. But I know from people that I've spoken to that Kids Help Phone really does make a difference. And it really does help to have someone to talk to. So. Never feel like you don't have anyone. There always is an adult willing to speak with you about any issues that you might be having or just difficulties you might be experiencing right now. That's what they're there for. So I wish you guys all the best. I hope that you're staying healthy and safe. And I will see you again next week, hopefully. Same time, same place. And if you have questions in the meantime, send them in and we will cover them next week. Or if you want to get in touch with one of our online tutors, send a message to us either through our website scholarlyelite.com or however you feel most comfortable getting in touch with us and we can set you up 
with an online tutor who can more specifically address what it is that you want to work on. Okay, so wishing you guys all the best and talk to you again next week. Have a great day. Bye.